Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Itai Gadot. I'm with DMG. DMG is a cross platform digital advertising solution that helps publishers monetize their uh, um, inventory and, of course, help publishers also um, get discovered on mobile and online as well. Um, before we start and introduce this amazing roster of experts in mobile monetization, um, let me ask you a few questions. Are there any developers here? Raise your hand. Developers? Perfect. Um, business people? People on the business side, monetization side? Wow, even great. Um, raise your hand if you're making lots of money on mobile. I'm talking lots of money. OK, go and ask them afterwards how they make it. Um, anyone else? OK, who went to a kick-ass party this week? OK, um, we have two more days to do that. So let me just, uh, Martin, can I see the slide, please? Martin? Excellent. Um, before we start, this number, we're talking about four years from now. So this is what's going to happen in 2018. $40 billion in ad spend are ready for you guys. $40 billion by Gartner. This is amazing. Another number. They told me it's sensitive, but not that much. Um, 1 billion iOS devices are going to be out there in 2018. So you can only imagine, Eliav, how many Android um, devices are going to be there, uh, which is huge. So we're talking about high-end engaging devices um, to monetize with. And this shows you the potentials that, that we have here. And the last slide I want to show you is that in 2017, more than 94% of all mobile app downloads are going to be free. In 2013, it was 91%. In 2017, it's going to be more than 94% of all mobile app, app downloads free. Which, you know, if they're free, it begs the question, where's the money here? So we're going to answer this question with these amazing people here. I'll start with lady first. I'll start with uh, Jesse Gillette with Pandora. Jesse, why don't you say a few words sure. about yourself and Pandora? My name is Jesse Gillette. I'm from Pandora Internet Radio, which is over 200 million registered users in the US. It's an internet radio company with a large presence in the mobile app space as well. I run our advertising business development team. So I monetize with a variety of different methods, but I work with our third parties, ad tech companies, uh, head up our programmatic side, and dabbling in audience extension as well. OK, thanks a lot, Pandora. Always a pleasure having you. Asaf. Asaf Benjamin with NativeX. Hi, everybody. My name is Asaf. Thank you for Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Asaf Benjamin from NativeX. NativeX is a uh, mobile supply side platform for mobile developers. We work with mobile developers and publishers, help them monetize their applications, and basically helping them build a business case around their, uh, around their applications. Excellent. Thank you. And we have Vili Hayeri, right? Yes. Um, he's, uh, he's with uh, Play Haven Contagion. Before that, he was SVP for uh, brand marketing at Rovio. So if your life is filled with angry birds and bad piggies all over you go, you can blame this guy here. Guilty as charged. Exactly. Uh, anyway, uh, my name is Ville Heijari. Uh, I'm with uh, Contagion Playhaven. Uh, so these two companies, Playhaven and Contagion, merged in December. So we're combining uh, mobile and app analytics uh, with marketing tools, engagement tools to optimize LTV and monetization. Thanks a lot. Alon Golan with Interactive. Yes, my name is Alon Golan. I'm with Interactive, a mobile supply side platform, meaning a platform for um, application developers and mobile publishers in general, both on mobile web and uh, native applications. It's a cross-platform uh, product, and uh, we help publishers basically monetize their inventory, especially the premium ones, with uh, the ones that have a uh, very large scale of, uh, of users. Thank you, Alon. So as you can see, you have here... You killed it.
Yeah? Cool, yeah. thank you. Um, so as you can see, we have uh, uh, the roster actually represent a lot of the um, um, aspects of mobile monetizations from, uh, from publisher to analytics, monetization, um, exchanges, and networks. So let me start with the uh, first question here today. Um, what are the most effective uh, monetization tools that we have today? I mean, we'll get to 2018 later on, but today. Really, I see that you're Well, I can start. So I'm, I'm thinking uh, not necessarily tools, but like principles and, and trends that, uh, that are there. And I think that the customer segmentation is probably the most important thing today. So we know a lot about the users. Uh, we know where they're coming from. We know what devices they're on. Uh, we know the device capabilities. We know the context. And we can also measure like, their habits on how they spend their time, how they spend their money. So when we can like, differentiate, like, for example, in a free-to-play or freemium economy, in, economy in, uh, in uh, who's the paying customer, who's the non-paying customer, I think that that's when we start to like, serve the right experience uh, in, in terms of advertising, monetization, in-app purchases to the, to the right audience as well. I see. So, I would add on to that. So Pandora primarily is advertising based and over 90% of our monetization comes from ads specifically. We have a non-ad option as well. So I think giving the options to the consumers are things that many apps do very well. So that's our subscription service. That's a small monthly cost. But the advertising side has really been driven by primarily audio, display, and video from our side. OK. Saf? Yeah, for us, in, uh, for us with NativeX, what we've been seeing in the past few years is a transition between all kinds of monetization tools. Some of them were gimmicks, some of them are you know, long sustainable tools. Uh, video has been around for pretty much a year and a half already and is doing great. However, on top of tools, uh, what we've seen, we've, we've been seeing is that, and I agree with you, Vilan, there should be a, some sort of a combination between the data and the tools that supports the data. So it's not only about learning who the customer is, what are they doing, how they're doing well or not well in the, you know, in the game or into the app right now, but also understanding what are the, you know, what are the tools, what are the um, mobile vehicles that we can actually stream down their, their end, whether it's a mobile video, whether it's an offer wall, etc. If we run those combinations with analytics, with predictive analytics and really understanding how to match the tools and the, know the, the knowledge that we have over those customers in real time, that's where we start uh, lifting ECPMs. And we've been seeing a lot of uh, very interesting case studies in the past few months just by merging these two together. The right monetization tool, make sure you have a lot of tools in your hand, but on the other hand, make sure you're using those tools with the right customers in the right timing. Thank you very much. Um, the, this panel is titled Tectonic Changes in the Monetization Panel. Um, and we call it that way because we, we saw in the last three, four years um, great changes in this what we call more global monetization uh, landscape. So we see ad networks becoming DSPs. We see the rise of DMPs that we'll talk about later on, data management platforms. Um, all kinds of changes that we see here. So, so I'd like us to, to make uh, create an order in the, in the chaos here, in the mess. So Alon, why don't you help us you know, briefly explain what's an SSP, what's an exchange, ad network, DMP, DSP? Um, so I'll try. There are many, uh, many shades of gray here um, since a lot of companies are sometimes uh, vertically integrated. So um, you know, you'll find uh, SSPs operating ad exchanges and networks operating uh, uh, DSP, et cetera. Um, Basically, I think that the model that was used uh, mostly uh, in the past was, uh, was ad networks that buy um, audiences or certain applications in, in bulk. They, they buy um, the media. And the DSP is probably uh, you know, the, more, um, the more advanced, the next step for ad networks to, uh, to monetize. They're mostly uh, based on programmatic technology where they can dissect, slice and dice every, imp every impression and decide how to bid and what to bid and you know, determine price, creative, et cetera. Um, so all of these DSPs, they work with ad exchanges. Um, it's basically the platform that enables this uh, real-time auction combination of ad networks and, and DSPs all together. 
Um, and I think that the, what differentiates uh, an SSP from an ad exchange um, is probably the control tools that publishers get. Um, tools to you know, decide what kind of buyers, what kind of advertisers you're willing to uh, share your users with. Um, you know, set floor prices, things like that, that allows you to you know, stay in control and, and invite buyers, et cetera, et cetera. OK. Anyone would like to add something here? Um, maybe about programmatic, because we hear a lot of programmatic RTBs coming in. Um, can you share with us some of your thoughts about that? Sure, I can Where's start there. So at Pandora, we, we embrace the idea of programmatic. We really like the idea of an invite-only private exchange in which we can connect directly to the advertisers, kind of similar to what Alon was speaking about in the exchange, where we have control over our inventory, which I think is really key for publishers or some of the app developers that were in the room. So really embracing all of the tools that are available. I would love to see more innovation on the publisher side as it relates to programmatic. But to a large extent, I think as much as we can direct connect, have a direct connection with the advertiser and actually bring either our first party data into the equation, they can bring their own data into the equation. And that's where we have higher incremental revenue value from that. They're getting the users that they want. And our users are really getting the right ad at the right time as well. So we love the idea of it. And we feel very strongly about mobile programmatic being uh, an even bigger force in the marketplace than it is today in web. So if there's one thing missing with um, what the publishers are doing right now to enable RTB for, for their traffic, what would that be? Can you repeat the question, sir? Sorry? Can you repeat that one more time? I didn't hear you. What would be this one thing uh, publishers are currently missing in terms of enabling their traffic to RTBs and programmatic buying, if, if, it, if at all? I'll jump in one more time, and then I can pass it off as well. But I think, again, the controlled aspect is really important on the publisher side. So we need to know who's buying. The buyer wants to know exactly what well-lit content and inventory they're running on. So I think the fear that many publishers have is that loss of control in their inventory and kind of an open exchange. It doesn't have to be that way. You can be very thoughtful and specific about setting up certain connections and not just letting your inventory go in the wild. I think that is the most important part for publishers to remember as they're diving into the world of programmatic. OK. Um, now, we, thanks. We, we hear a lot of, you know, lately we hear a lot of, uh, is that the time? Time flies when you're having fun. Um, uh, we hear a lot of um, uh, programmatic, and we also hear about video, because this is something new coming in, uh, which is um, uh, already bringing a lot of big money from brands and advertisers to the publishers. So how does programmatic and video, video go hand in hand? Because we hear a lot about that recently as well. I, I think it's important to differentiate. You know, we, we toss around and, and talk about a lot of term, terms here and uh, all kinds of uh, sort of professional terms. But at the end of the day, uh, the publishers mostly, um, and I'm not referring to Pandora, you know, they have a professional team that is only focused on monetization. Most of the publishers, you know, it can be the CEO of the, 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 the head of the studio or the developer themselves. So with regards to video and programmatic, it's really important to, first of all, when you start looking at it, to really understand what every, each one of these terminology, terms, what does it mean? What do I do with it? And then start, you know, try to understand what do I do with it? If I want to do something with it, it is something that is relevant to me. Like for example, with programmatic and video, programmatic, you know, RTB and programmatic buying have been a huge buzz in the past, you know, year and a half, I would say. Only today, um, actually, in this show, I really start seeing a lot of a, a lot of ad networks, the smallest guys, already lining up with their, you know, with their bidders. Hey, can you guys take us in? Can you integrate us in? So it's really, it's really important to you know, differentiate between the buzz and what's really going on. That's one thing. Second, RTB and programmatic is a, is, a, is a way of, is a tactic, is a way of doing things, is a way of buying and selling your inventory as a publisher. Video is one of the tools that we are using into those you know, methods of buying. So we can buy and sell programmatically banners. We can buy and sell programmatically interstitials, offer walls, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
So video, it's a great tool, it converts well, but you know, to say video works well and converts well is a huge definition. You really need to look into your application. What is the demographic? Who are using this? Who is using this uh, uh, application? Who is going to be, you know, the one that likely to convert? The like, the one who can actually click on the video, and then start thinking about video, yes or no, RTB, yes or no, and with whom. Most of the publishers, again, unlike Pandora, most of the publishers are not going to build their own. RTB uh, capabilities by themselves, and it's really important to hook up with a, you know, a, a, basically a partner, uh, a platform that can help you run those those tools into your app. Okay, thanks. Um, with programmatic, and I think Vili, you, you said that before about shifting from buying traffic to audience buying. Um, can you explain a little bit on that of how the industry is changing in that way. So, especially like in, uh, in uh, mobile games, and of course other applications as well, but mobile games, uh, user acquisition is like hyper competitive. Uh, all of the bigger publishers who are, who are, we have a couple of examples now of mobile developer, game developers who make, make more than billion dollars of revenue every year. And, uh, and um, uh, it's, it's very tough to compete with those people so it's sort of like this mantra that retention is the new acquisition. It's, it's, it's cheaper to retain a customer, try to reactivate a customer, keep them in, uh, than to acquire a new one. So, so retention has become really like the, like the key metric there. And um, uh, all of this, uh, like uh, how, we, how we look at like in the downstream, like how do we monetize with advertising? Not necessarily like how we serve advertising, but how do, how do we monetize with them? It's, it's crucial in application development that the, we first of all sort of find the audience who's receptive to ads and then keep up with the retention analysis that we keep those people, that we're not just like sending them away uh, as, a, as a cheap exchange for advertising revenue. And I think that video has actually, actually proven like super successful there thus far on this sort of value exchange model where you have like, for example, uh, videos supporting video advertising supporting like the in-game economy where players can earn things for watching video and so forth and at the same time obviously generating generating revenue through to uh, through views and clicks okay um, thanks um, do you want someone wants to add here something yeah. about I, yeah go ahead. I think that the best thing um, I think that the best thing can you hear me yeah okay I can hear you well it's I think the best thing that uh, programmatic and video brought to the space for, for mobile app publishers is um, the brand dollars. It's the brand advertisers that were missing for quite some time. So it's the Procter & Gamble's of the world, it's Coca-Cola's of the world. And we see it especially in video where almost all ad inventory is, uh, is of brand names, which is something that, uh, you know, it's much more fun seeing a really cool ad, especially if it's video on, a, on an application, than something which is uh, you know, more dodgy. Yeah. So it's, it's a very interesting angle, angle because in 2013, most, not most, but a lot of the, of the uh, monetization came from actually apps. So publishers are actually being advertisers themselves and um, uh, promoting their apps through other publishers' traffic. And this proved to be a great um, a great way to monetize and get discovered. So publishers can enjoy uh, both sides. So how does it, um, how, what does it mean in terms of bringing the big brands? Um, so we know that a lot of the advertising coming from publishers, how now on, on top of that success, we can lure the brands and the advertising agencies out there? I think that I think that two things are happening. Uh, first of all, you know, mobile mobile publishers will keep cross promoting. Um, it will just become more scientific, as Billy said. And I think that whenever the uh, the ecosystem is more clean with programmatic uh, technology, then um, I think brands will feel safer entering this um, this arena as well. Okay. I, I would add to that and say um, specifically uh, around data. I think we all agree that data is the future of mobile advertising. And as much as we can replicate how agencies are used to buying digitally, not on mobile, whether it's on video, even broadcast radio, as long as we can bring that same type of ecosystem into the mobile side where they can feel comfortable bidding on or just purchasing 
users knowing that they are high household income, um, they might live in a certain area, that sort of thing. I think that's really the key to getting brand advertisers to feel comfortable on mobile. That's something we've focused on and continue to focus on. And we're seeing really interesting kind of first party data segments that are emerging from our own data that are actionable, that we're bringing to agencies that they're very interested in. And then to further on the, the point that was brought up on video, they're used to video. They understand video, and if they can give you a 15, 30-second video on mobile without having to reproduce a new creative, that's a really easy way for them to step into mobile in a way that they understand, at least to some extent. So I think video is pretty key, and data is very key. Excellent. I want to, uh, I want to respectfully, respectfully disagree. <laughs> I Finally, I someone know. disagrees here. OK. No, actually, we, we thought that somebody has to say it, so I did. I actually agree. <laughs> no, but one more thing I want to add is that uh, this is all very important, but if we talk about publishers and, and you know, developers, long tail, mid-sized guys, again, not the big, you know, the, the big uh, tier one guys, the most important thing that this shift is doing is that it forces the publishers to work harder. Now, when they work harder, when they bring on board more parameters that we, the monetization tools, can actually identify, work with, and then pass it to those brands, if they work harder, they get more because we are able to target, in a better way, their target audiences. Advertisers like Coca-Cola and Procter & Gamble, you know, two years ago, three years ago, really, nobody really, really understood what does it mean to buy on mobile applications? You know, the heads of the marketing, uh, marketing uh, departments were like, okay, so we're buying on display, we're, we're buying on mobile, mobile application is huge, bring me something on mobile. That was the level of conversation. Today, more and more, 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 and more brands, not even the biggest one, you know, the, the, other, the, the, the guys that are coming you know, after those on the chain, they already understand that there is a huge difference between mobile apps that are games, that are entertainment, that are utilities, and even with, within games, there are all kinds of games. You can't just buy mobile inventory. And so for the publishers, if they understand, when they see this, and when they see that there is more video coming, more brands are becoming available, the more parameters, the more data you will build into your, uh, your uh, application, and the more data you will be able to share with your monetization partner, the more you generate revenues. And your monetization tool, monetization process will be much, much more effective. Do you think, uh, just for all of you, that um, um, agencies are are they following or leading in terms of what they want? I mean, everybody likes their own comfort zone. And it was said back at the beginning of the online, uh, of the digital age, that, uh, for example, um, uh, it was the MC Sachi CEO who said that, we know we need to go there to mobile and digital, um, and we'll go there not because we want to, because we have to. So. It means that, okay, we're taking people out of their comfort zone. How can we ease this, you know, going out from their comfort zone and let, helping them understand that mobile is the way to go if you want to uh, run brands? Um, Asaf mentioned the, the, the data and uh, analytics. Uh, any other, you know, tips for us all to, to better bring the brands? Well, that's a, that's a that's a very interesting interesting angle because I'm I'm thinking it like in term well, when I'm looking at this uh, from the publisher perspective, uh, when we we obviously like everybody's excited to, about brands finally getting in there, and uh, but what you mentioned like even even as um, like Pandora as a, if you think of it as a media and as a network, uh, you uh, it's it's really interesting that you you have this like invite only like sort of preferred. Uh, like match sort of matching partners, and and uh, for when I'm if, for example like uh, like Angry Birds is an example. Uh, it's not just just uh, example. E exactly, yeah. it's not just some like homogenous like mass of mobile users there. So so you know there's a lot of kids playing. Like want somebody think of the children, and uh, and uh, it's 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 not that you can you can just like advertise any brand there. It doesn't make any sense, and it, of course it doesn't add any value to the advertiser. So I I think that like um, when we're talking about especially small publishers, 
uh, they're not going to have the luxury of, of screening and managing like this kind of like uh, individual brand campaigns and so on. So I, I think that like uh, there needs to be there needs to be like a like a techno <laughs> technology arbitrator there there in the mix. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I would also add on just in the sense that what we've found is you can't really you can't shame advertisers into running on mobile if they're not ready to do that yet. There's just no, even if we all know, and the people certainly at this conference and, and here in Barcelona this week, that we know the user behavior is clearly on mobile. All of the usage, that's where the eyeballs are, that's where you're interacting more and more every day. And advertisers do start to understand that, but from the agency's perspective, their motivation is very much to you know, get or grow the same budget that they had before. And there are sort of safe places where attribution, I think, is really key as well to getting agency dollars, because if they know they can attribute something over here, and they've been doing that for years, it's a little bit scary to go into the world of mobile and not know exactly how you're going to attribute that same statistic back that you've been reporting back to your advertiser for years. So I think that that is gradually happening, but the easier we make it with the tools, and apparently Asif thinks publishers need to work harder, and that's the key to all the hard work in the industry that will shoulder the, the burden of, I'm kidding, but in terms of making it a little less scary for a media planner to feel that they can put that budget somewhere that they're not specifically sure how exactly it works, it takes time, but it's getting there. And I think, again, the more education and the better tools that they have, that is very much on everybody in the ecosystem to get them to feel safe to put their budgets in mobile. Okay, well, very interesting insight. Oh, no? okay. Um, as we mentioned, on, mobile is always one phase behind online, all the online pra best practices, going to mobile and then some. Um, so also here, there's a question since you know, mobile monetization, mobile as a whole, is it's in infancy right now, and I think we can all agree on that. Um, so what will be the next thing? I mean, there's the, clearly we have display banners right now. So what's, what's next for us in the day after the display banners uh, uh, in terms of verticals that we spoke about, uh, native ads, advertorials. Uh, wh wh where are we going with that? Um, so I think that uh, even for display banners, there's uh, much more potential still. Um, with location and better data and, and targeting capabilities that advertisers will build along with the monetization platforms, um, you know, even a banner which is highly targeted uh, to a user could be uh, much more beneficial uh, both for the advertiser and the user. Um, I think that video advertising is again something which is, uh, it's funny, but it, it is still pretty new. And you know, if you look even further than that, then uh, I think there's no doubt that um, native ads, which is a little bit of a vague definition for now, um, if they're done right and they are suitable for each and every application or a mobile website, um, I'd say that's, that's the uh, future of it. So I think you were served a nice ball here. Fair to answer. I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I agree, but uh, again, I think the definition or the differentiation of terminology is really important. So, you know, we can guess around. I personally think banners are dead. You know, to be really, you know, to go with it. The high run, the, it's still the highest runner traffic wise. Volume wise, the most usable tool that we see out there is still, are still banners. Are we looking into, you know, do we see margins there? Probably not. Do we see margins that are going up? Definitely not. So, you know, native ad, native X, we are mostly doing, uh, working with mobile app developers. That's, you know, almost 100% of, of our inventory. We have thousands of publishers, mobile game publishers that are working with, with our SDK. They don't want to have any, any banners. Um, they, as you meant, rightfully mentioned, uh, they, uh, they have a lot of faith into native ads because it really ease up or, or enhancing the user experience. And by the way, all of the publishers out there that are really concerned about the user experience and how do we how are we possibly going to uh, uh, ruin it with monetization? Uh, we are all sharing the same interest. We don't want to ruin user experience because we know today that the lifetime value of each one of the users affect all of us. And so with regards to the tools, 
I'm not sure if we can actually, if we know how to analyze what's going to happen in four years tool-wise, whether it's going to be video, banners, interstitials, offer walls, etc. Strategically, I think that you know, if we look at traditional advertising, it all comes down to focus on the right target audience. Every question, every debate, every brief starts with who's the target audience. And so four years now, from now, I assume we will be you know, much smarter, much more knowledgeable, and we will have the capabilities to understand not each one of the user of this app at the moment, but each one of the users in private. And we will be able to really identify who is this user and identify those, you know, the user across all screens. You know, the, you know, the, the Samsung and HTC and Microsoft visions, three screens. Um, we will probably be able to identify the same user across the board and really identify not only what are the relevant tools to work with this guy, but what are the relevant products, what, is, what are the, his behavioral patterns. We see this today with NativeX. We've already started working on uh, what we call um, emotional behavior to identify the emotion of the user while playing a game, a mobile game, and then match the right monetization tool. So again, I don't think it's about the tools. I think it's about really understanding who is using those tools. But at, at the same time, when you say that like banner is dead, uh, we you know we can say that banner is dead. We can say that like free to play, like like in gaming, especially like free to play economy. That's the way to go. That's where you make the revenue within a purchases. And then we go around the world and preach like how to make good free to play games and how to do like most powerful advertising. And what happens then? Somebody releases Flappy Bird, like one guy, like a simple game, no IAP, one banner placement, like arguably generating tens of thousands of dollars of revenue every day. And I think that like four years from now, that's still going to be possible. Like somebody can do something and it becomes viral and it has like really brute force approach and it's successful. But at the same time, you're going to be able to have so much more sophistication that you don't need to be there, like that, that number one phenomenon. You can be a much smaller thing uh, with much more sophistication and intelligence and, and, and doing things in a highly targeted way and make that, make that like similar, similar scale like business, like make the same financial success on a much, much smaller reach. I respectfully agree. Um, <laughs> no, but seriously, when you look at it, at the end of the day, there are, there are going to be, you know, if we believe in the, in the, the stickiness of the application model, and, and we're probably going to stick around with the application because it simply makes sense. It's no, more, it's no longer a gimmick. It's here to stay, right? So we're going to have millions of applications in the app stores, probably numerous app stores. Um, one example of this is not something that a publisher wants to, you know, to rely on. Rely on. Uh, at the end of the day, if you're a publisher and you want to build a, an app and build a business around it, you have to aim towards something, toward a solution that will make sense. And so banners, you know, we'll probably still have banners, but if you need to see a sustainable growth, sustainable revenues from it, the chances that, you know, this will happen again are getting smaller and smaller. And, I, I, you know, think about smartphones, a versus feature phone. It's pretty much the same, pretty much the same phenomenon. There are still tons of feature phone out there, but nobody talks about it. Everybody is looking into, you know, the smartphone and the, the low entry Nokia based on Android kind of kind of stuff that just came out. So it, we see the shift is happening, and uh, it'll be interesting. By the way, you mentioned before about the plethora of apps that, that are out there. You know, iOS, Android, feature phones. They also have, you know, Asha also have their own. Even Angry Birds on Asha, we have that as well. Um, so in, with all those apps out there, um, you know, if, if, if we want to monetize the apps, first they're they need to be out there. They need to go live. Someone needs to download them. So can you shed some light on user acquisition for us? Of course. So uh, basically, like, uh, if you think about like, how, how are these success, most successful companies uh, monetizing and, and, and how are they getting users th today? Basically, they could be putting on any given day anything from 10 to 35% of their revenue back into getting more users, users on board. And uh, I, 
I think that like that's something that when, when if you're a starting developer, you're launching your new application, you're not going to be able to do that. Like, like uh, uh, if you if you go to uh, uh, venture-backed uh, game companies in Silicon Valley, uh, and they they launch new games and they start to make revenue. How much money do you think, how much, what kind of percentage of their revenue do you think that they're putting into user acquisition? 100. Because they're focusing on development, anything they make, they're just trying to scale up, scale up, scale up, and retain those players. And I, I think that like, uh, no matter like where you acquire the users from, you need to be smart about it, that you, you really like attribute those channels, like where is the valuable traffic coming to you? Like if your key market is, uh, Israel or Indonesia, and uh, why, why would you focus on the U.S. If, if you don't, if you're not getting the valuable customers from there? So it's about like finding, uh, like com uh, constantly measuring where are your users coming from and how are they behaving in your app, and and focusing on those markets and and keeping that focus and refocusing pretty much like every day, every week. Okay. Cool. Oh. No? So um, here's for you something uh, interesting that I wanted to ask you alone. Um, we have different business models to monetize apps and in mobile, mobile web, mobile apps. So share some of those um, interesting business models that you know, people here can, next time when we ask them the question, are you making big bucks, will raise their hand. Um, so yeah, I think that um, any, uh, any, app, any application uh, publisher that is trying to uh, trying to monetize its inventory using ads for example um, I think the most popular um, the most popular business models are revenue share with with the with the ad exchanges um, publishers who have a, you know a, a very big uh, sales force of their own will probably have an ad server uh, so they will have to pay serving fees which is some some uh, some sort of a flat CPM sometimes tiered uh, against um, volumes of, of traffic, of inventory. Um, I think that in video for now, in mobile, and this might change you know, next week, but uh, we're seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of campaigns and a lot of, set of uh, sets of, um, of video streams that are, uh, you know, are being paid as um, you know, flat CPM, which means it's basically buying the media for some sort of a flat price, um, which is Kind of, you know, kind of the best thing for uh, application publishers because they they basically take much little risk here. Okay, thanks. Uh, well, one of the more interesting ones uh, in in free-to-play economies is um, is like uh, using segmentation to serve people with virtual goods, virtual good promotions. So basically, when you have your users, your players. There's always going to be a huge majority who don't spend any money in, a, in an app, in a game. And then there's going to be a very tiny fragment of people who spend a lot of money and anything from between. So uh, you often have like in games, a lot of developers put like sort of hard coded like special offers, like some kind of weekend discount or whatever. But you can actually think of your customers like merchandise for each customer segment separately. So if somebody is already spending like uh, $50 a month on your game, uh, why would you promote something for 99 cents for them? Because they probably, they're already engaged enough that they, they probably want something more. So you can give them like major discounts on something far more expensive. And at the same time, uh, when you have non-paying customers, who you basically need, you, you want the trigger that like first time purchase, that they, they don't even think about like spending money on your game, but huh, what if you can serve them like with some kind of, uh, you know, value proposition that's just like too good to pass. So again, it comes down to segmenting the users. Like we all, when we go to, go to supermarkets, uh, why do we see Coca-Cola more prominently than something else? And I, I think that this is, this is like many developers who are going into free-to-play, they're not thinking of this, this sort of e-commerce aspect. They're just thinking about the gameplay, the design, uh, putting those elements there and thinking about how can we monetize off, off the gameplay. But then, how about that, that, uh, that part of your economy as, as, uh, as e-commerce and, and merchandising those items? I think though, there's a, there are like very good, very tried and true strategies there that can be, can be used. Right. Yeah, I would add on to that because I think something you had touched on earlier as well, which is really giving the consumer some choices in the matter. So I would say, you know, picturing four years from now myself, what I would like to see as someone who engages frequently with apps in addition to 
representing my own, really the idea of, say, Pandora, an example might be when you first log into Pandora, you have your station, it starts to play, and you can opt into an hour of ad-free listening, let's say, sponsored by Coca-Cola. I would do that as a user, and I think it kind of passes the litmus test. If you personally would engage in that behavior, there's something of value that you can offer to the user, and it actually benefits you financially, like, fantastic. Everybody wins. Coca-Cola has a great brand recognition. The user gets ad-free listening, and Pandora gets a higher CPM during that hour of sponsored by Coca-Cola. But there's a million examples of that in many apps in which just to keep trying and to keep finding things that you can actually offer the user some choice in what how they want to interact. So I'm, I'm constantly surprised by the fact that users tend to understand they're getting something for free, and so they are willing to, in our case, listen to 30 seconds of ads an hour or look at a banner ad. And there's a, a real understanding of that. And so I think if the more you can actually kind of placate to their decision making and their choices in the matter, it's a huge opportunity. And a lot, uh, again, this is a good native, native X opportunity as well in the sense that that is sort of at the core what native advertising is. It's sort of integrating content into your user experience. And then from there, you can have offshoots of in-app revenue as well that you might not have known that existed. I, li I like what you said about you know, this unofficial agreement signed between the developer and the end user that they'll get high quality content for free in term of something that they'll do occasionally uh, for them. Um, I'd, I'd like to open the floor for a question. If someone has a question, go ahead. Uh, can you approach the, um, let's, oh, they have a mic, okay. Miguel Martin from Donuts Publicity. Would like to know what you think about incentivated uh, advertising. Uh, happy to speak about this. Uh, so, and thank you for the question. Um, so, with regards to incentivized, um, I can speak on behalf of the gaming, you know, community that we work with. Incentivized is huge. Uh, if you're familiar with the term CPI, cost per installation, uh, this is basically what uh, NativeX is doing. Um, in the past 12 months, we have we've identified. Um, the, you know, the, the shift that the major studios have gone through where 12 months ago they were like, yeah, we do in-app purchasing, we're good. Don't talk to us about advertising, don't talk to us about in-app advertising. Videos, interstitials, you know, not interested. In-app purchasing, that's the name of the game. That was 12 months ago. And we started seeing that more and more um, the big whales, the big guys, you know, the Supercell, Kabam, you know, Glee, Kogay, Greek, all of these guys, um, slowly but surely understand that they are leaving money on the table. And so the combination of what we've just talked about, you know, the data and identifying those people allow us to uh, address these guys with incentivized ads, all kinds of incentivized ads, even offer walls that are doing extremely well and you know, a lot of people in the industry thought that offerwalls are dead, and offerwalls are you know, uh, harassment. Um, guess what? They're not. Done correctly, planned and, and executed on the, you know, on the right moment in the game, with the right user, with the right frequency cap, etc. An offerwall with five, six videos, you're making money. And you're doing it in a way that the user experience is not, you know, is not, uh, um, you know, interrupted. And that actually, thanks, thank you, Martin. And it, this actually leads us, you know, back to the beginning of the discussion, where, discussion when we're talking about app downloads and, um, uh, you know, driving the market and everything. I'm sure there are a lot of experts around here that can talk with you about that um, as well. I see that we ran out of time. Um, um, I just want, you know, to, to still two more minutes from the organizers and ask the uh, amazing roster that we have here today. If I'm an app developer, you know, in a few words, what should I do to make a sustainable uh, business out of my mobile app content, whatever it's going to be in the next few years? And we're talking about big business. Let's start with you, Alon. Um, in a few words, please. I think that every uh, app developer has to understand that the user experience is probably the most important thing for them, but they, they also have to 
eventually, and eventually it could take, could take a while, think of how they make a business out of it. And if it's in a purchasing, they really, really, really need to understand uh, their, what their users are like. And if it's ads, then I guess you know, consulting with some of the industry experts on, on what the advertisers are looking for, what kind of um, data, what kind of users, things like that, um, that's the most important thing. Thanks, Alon. Go ahead. Uh, my like, sort of rule of thumb is that make apps, don't make technology. So basically, if you're building an application, if you're building a product or service, don't waste your resources on building unnecessary infrastructure. So there's so many technology solutions out there to choose from already that you can basically go and pick and choose and pick and mix what works for your application and your service. No need to like start building your own 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 architecture and make your own analytics platform. If there's like some singular like granularity that you think that none of these commercial solutions, for example, can measure for you, you'll figure it out in the long run then. But but it's it's just that you need to focus on the product and get the product out there. Don't don't build infrastructure when it's when it's not necessary. Great, thanks, Bila. Oh, Jesse. I would say, uh, to echo the, the previous points, I mean, content is obviously the most important part. You want people to use and engage your app. And by making a quality app where you're focusing on what's working and setting it up from the very get-go to actually be able to ingest that information and act on it is really important. And it shouldn't be an after, afterthought. And there are plenty of companies out there that are able to help from that with that from the very beginning. Um, we've already kind of beat the dead horse on the, the data aspects, but I think that is going to take off in the next several years and be a really key component to content providers as well as advertisers and really make a more seamless transition for that app agency money to flow into mobile. But I think really most importantly, the content of the app itself, and there's lots of interesting things that app developers are doing today with time-based kind of more urgent things, Pandora's, um, not one of those companies, but like a Candy Crush or others that really ha make a reason for the user to come back. Those are all interesting mechanisms that you can play with to really get a sticky app. And once you kind of hit that and you start to understand what that takes, I think there's a lot of potential. And may I say, Pandora has an amazing content. Thank uh, you. All the time. I'll pay you later <laughs> offline for that. Check is in the mail. <laughs> um, I would say two things. First of all, build you know, build tools into the app that allows you to get the data. Um, I agree, don't try and build your own analytics platform and analyze this data, you know, and, and try to understand it. There will be, along the way, there will be 30,000 different monetization tools that will be ready and happy to help you with this data. But make sure you have the data, because data is power, uh, and you know it gets you know it gets even bigger than than what we see today. The second thing is start thinking about monetization early, because most of the publishers I know you know they're done they they're done with coding. They sit back and they said, okay, now what? Where do we place this banner? Exactly, and 95% of those, what they do is they would call their buddies because they are also a publisher, also a game developer. Hey, who are you using? That's the last thing you want to do. You have to start thinking and learning and understanding monetization already halfway into building your app. Great. Thanks, Asaf. So feel free to address all of us here, because our time is up. And as the slide shows, we'll show you the money. Thank you very much for being here with us. Uh, we enjoyed it. And uh, talk to us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.